Rashida Tlaib was censured yesterday. She was the 28th member of the House of Representatives to be censured in the history of the United States. And upon this action, I had several thoughts. Uh, my first thought was a memory of when I was in 11th or 12th grade and I had to take a, you know, government or civics class, you know, for graduation credit. And it's when I became, you know, more familiar with uh, congressional procedure and all that. And I was reading about censure and it says this is a formal reprimand from, you know, the the House or the Senate uh, against the one member for, you know, unparliamentary actions or whatever. And so I was like, okay. And I kept reading. It's like, okay, so so then what? And that was it. <laughs> that, 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 that's it. <laughs> it's a, I was I was shocked that, that it just stopped there. And what's really funny is that there's two levels of it. There's a reprimand and there's a censure. And there's no difference between the two, except that for the censure, you have to stand in front of the body of the House or the Senate and have them read to you why you've been a very bad boy. And I thought that was just like, OK, so what's the point of this thing? This is very odd. I, I never got that. But uh, when I picked this topic, I did some looking and I had to find out about the censure, like how it's been used through history. I uh, only 28 times. And the first person to be censured in the history of the House of Representatives was a man named William Stanberry in 1832. And he was censured for insulting the Speaker of the House. And his, uh, his statement was directed toward House Speaker Andrew Stevenson. And he said that Andrew Stevenson's eye may be too frequently turned away from his chair and towards the White House instead. They, they censured him for that. They, they censured him for, for saying that. That was, that was kind of weird. The second person to be censured was Joshua Giddens in 1842 for introducing an anti-slavery resolution uh, because there was a gag order against talking uh, about slavery back then. And so, you know, his crime was saying, hey, maybe we should get rid of slavery. And that was that was a no-go. But uh, my second thought was like what what she was actually censured for. And it was for her statements or for her embracing of the statement from the river to the sea. And the entire phrase is from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free. And I read that and I, I will fully admit I was not aware of this phrase from the river to the sea. I mean, once I, once she said, I, I know what river and what sea they're talking about. So it makes it makes sense. But I tried to look at this as, you know, fairly as possible because the charges are, the allegation is that it's an anti-Semitic statement, that, uh, you know, Jewish people should be eradicated. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, it doesn't say that. I mean, a phrase can mean whatever you want. I, I grant that. But the important part of the statement is the Palestine should be free part. Like, it's not a statement of overt aggression or uh, ethnic cleansing. And also that's what's going on right now. Like the reality in the world is that the Palestinian people are being driven away from their land. They are being killed indiscriminately. And the fact that anyone is being punished for saying that Palestine should be free is I guess not surprising, but it's still incredibly disheartening. I, I, John, I'm sure you're going to disagree with everything I said. So let's, let's see what you got to say. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I'm not going to really disagree at all here. First of all, I'm going to I'm going to apologize to Corey for TJ getting in his lane and giving us a history lesson. Uh, <laughs> um, but, I wasn't going to oh, say anything. It. He but, loved you know. every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but no, I I think it the whole from the river to the sea thing and and this censure censure ring um censorship censuring i really don't know the term <laughs> um uh is a great talking point like a meta talking point of the entire position of the u.s government when it comes to this conflict because you can take from the river to the sea kind of however you want as you said phrases have different meanings and there are a large group of people um who will say that it's an anti-semitic phrase every time and i don't think that's entirely true because the origins of the phrase and how it is used by many palestinians doesn't call for violence it just means we want to be free some people say it as a call for a one state palestinian solution which you know that does kind of mean no more israel but i don't think that's any morally different than no more palestine um which is yeah. de facto the position of the u.s government um and by the way 
something that multiple other congressmen have said. You've had congressmen saying, let's turn Gaza into a parking lot. Uh, you know, we, we've had the literal White House say that there's no red line, that Israel can kill as many Palestinians as they want. They won't stop them. Like that is the de facto position of the U.S. government is no more Gaza, um, you know, whether they're outright saying it or not, and some of them are. So to me, it, it, we can debate until we want, until we're right in the face about, hey, is this an anti-Semitic phrase? But I think that's missing the point. Because to me, I don't say that phrase just because some people take offense to it. And like, it's kind of like a uh, defund the police thing to me where I'm like, yeah, no, I, I I can fight this fight all day long, but I don't think it's an effective phrase because you're just going to make enemies of people. That being said, I think the broader discussion here is that we've had plenty of congressmen make vile statements, you know, about the people of Gaza. And then we have the the only Palestinian woman in Congress. The only Palestinian woman. And that's, that's yeah, the yeah. one they choose to censure. Like the, the overt racism of that. It's just something that you'll look back in history books and be like, yeah, of course they were that racist. Um, it, it, it just it should be so obvious to people. And I don't know why it isn't. Um do I have uh, an, any disagreement yes, on that? From, yes, uh... yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> no. Corey, are you no, you're not... to jump in? You're not going to get any disagreement with me on any of that. Uh, I think the biggest thing is just looking at like why they did it. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just playing politics with semantics. I mean, like you said, this phrase historically is, you know, a call, a rallying cry for Palestinians to be free in their own land. And there are some people in the Jewish community who see it as TJ pointed out a phrase that means no more Israel. Uh, if you look at the 22 Democrats that voted along with the Republicans to uh, censure uh, Rashida Tlaib, it is mostly Jewish members uh, of the Congress. So obviously they see the phrase in its problematic um, sense and that's what compelled them to uh, vote for censure. But I believe that this is all part of an even larger uh, political gambit because the Democratic Party is facing a real crisis here with this particular scenario. Obviously their crisis is nowhere near as bad as the crisis that people in Gaza are actually experiencing. But the crisis is the political crisis of, you know, we have Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, and we have Jewish Americans, and they both overwhelmingly vote for the Democratic Party, right? They're two yeah. very uh, reliable bases for the Democrats. But now you've got this, you know, no lose situation, or I'm sorry, no win situation, a lose lose situation where if we go too far for one side over the other, we're going to lose the other side. And there's absolutely no middle ground here. Like if you're if you're pro Israel, you're going to lose Arab votes in places like Michigan and places like Minnesota. It's going to happen. If you're pro Palestine. You might lose Jewish votes in Nevada. You might lose Jewish votes in Florida. Now, granted, there are some young Jewish people uh, who are a little bit more nuanced on this situation because they lean left. Uh, obviously, Bernie Sanders, the most prominent Jewish member of, this, of the Senate, has been very critical of Israel. So losing the Jewish vote, I don't think, is as big of a risk as uh, losing the Arab vote. Yeah. But either one is possible. And I think right now the Democrats are just trying to figure out how can they even talk about this issue without completely screwing themselves with one of these bases or the others. In this particular case, you know, anti-Semitism has been on a rise in the United States even long before this issue, even long before this Israel-Hamas conflict, you know, of more recent uh, days broke out. So I think their stance is, well, look, when, when you know, COVID was going on and there was a lot of um, anti-Asian hate, we took a stance against that. Uh, you know, when the George Floyd stuff was going on and, and the racial tensions were, were high there, we took a stance there. I guess we kind of have to take a stance here so we don't make it seem like we're, you know, for anti-Semitism. But like you both pointed out, this statement, I don't think Tlaib meant it in an anti-Semitic way. And a lot of people don't see it like that. So this is a little bit more um, in you know, murky, murky territory than those other instances. But I think it was just that simple. I think the Democrats felt like they had to do this so that they didn't seem like they were approving of anti-Semitism. But like TJ already pointed out, censoring is completely useless. It has absolutely no effect on anything. So it's more of just a public humiliation factor than anything else at this point. Yeah, so like, um, I think like a week ago or something like that, or two weeks ago, like, I don't know, it's like after seeing so many like people get bombed out over in Gaza, it's like, it's hard to remember exactly when I saw certain videos about certain things, but like Al Jazeera made a video about the phrase and like the history of the phrase. And it, there's nothing anti-Semitic about the phrase. It's just, hey, Palestine should be free. These people should be allowed to exist. That's all it was. And like, it got misconstrued over time to like have some sort of anti-Semitic you know, overtone with it, but it, it's like, it's not that it, it was never about that. And like, you know, 
as far as the bigger picture is like how do we even get here it's like you looking at how that phrase became you know anti-semitic even though it's like there was nothing anti-semitic or just like looking at um how the overton window of everybody's thoughts on israel and zionism like has changed over time like um i don't know like who follows who on what platform but like pretzels and spice had a really great video about the overton window um like a month ago or something like that and then recently i saw a video from uh madeline pendleton was talking about um um how the overton window has changed on israel and zionism and she pointed out like back in was it 1982 ronald reagan the devil himself i have to burn sage in my house after just saying his name you know was calling for a ceasefire with israel and lebanon 2001 george bush calls for a ceasefire between israel and gaza 2008 george bush george w fool me once shame on you fool me twice can't get fooled again bush the occupation you know uh, of west bank you know but in two in, in 2019 rashida talib can't even go home to you know visit or can't go to palestine to go to west bank to visit her grandmother her 90 year old grandmother who lives there because it might be one of the last times that she's actually able to you know to visit her while she's still alive you know she gets rejected uh um her, her permission gets rejected to, to go to that trip by netanyahu you know because it might be political you know she might say the wrong thing about the plight of the palestinian people you know and, and what they're going through you know and now you know 2023 we have politicians saying yeah you should just kill all of them you should just bomb them all carpet bomb the thing turn the place into the parking lot like how did we get here? You know, how is the phrase? It's like, hey, people should have rights. You know, like, people should be free. People should be allowed, you know, self-governance, like become anti-Semitic. And how are the people, you know, that used to, like, how is freaking Ronald Reagan to, to the right of Bernie Sanders? Like, if you ever find me, or if I ever find myself to the right of Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, Candace Owens, Pierce, um, Pierce Morgan. If I find myself to the right of any of those people on any agenda, any issue, I'm gonna drop that issue because obviously <laughs> I was wrong and I don't <laughs> support that shit. Like that's it. That so it's like we we need to examine this. We need to like get everybody back on that same page. I mean. It, it, it can't like it it's it's wild how it's gotten to this point and i think we just need a deep dive on the to why this is happening and and how we have gotten here Ekan, yeah oh oh go ahead go ahead, john uh, i was just gonna say i'm again glad you brought up the overton window because i think that that is a very specific factor playing in this whole thing i was in a conversation with a zionist um which is never pleasant but i i i been doing it just to try and wrap my head around the ideology but they'd said we kind of had that conversation and they kind of agreed with me like yeah she might not have meant it to mean genocide but she's a smart woman she knows that some people are going to do it she knows that it could be a dog was for some people why would she choose that phrase um and i was like hmm, that is definitely an argument that i've made in the past about different phrases so so, so what what makes this different to me um and i I think that she was attempting to shift the Overton window. I think that she did know what she was doing. She used that phrase very specifically because she wanted to call out how bullshit it is that it's considered anti-Semitic. And honestly, I, I'll even put my hand up not too long ago. If you would have asked me, hey, is that anti-Semitic phrase? I would have just been like knee jerk. Yes. Even though I've been pro-Palestine for years and years and years, that was just like in my learnings, in my brain. Like, yeah, that's an anti-Semitic phrase. Don't use it. But like, the same people who are saying that is an anti-Semitic phrase are the ones saying criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic. And like I, I think that the more we talk about these things, the more we bring them into the national spotlight, the more Americans in general are going to be looking at it and going, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. What's anti-Semitic about saying people should be free? That's dumb. Um, but that, that's just I, I want to kind of point that out because I think that is at the core of this issue. TJ, what are you going to say? No, yeah, like I was going to talk about the Overton window thing as well, that mm -hmm. the steady progression of <sighs> the word Zionist is just like, I don't know, but it's like pro right wing, like fascist totalitarian rule by the Israeli government. Like that's what it is. And we've been like, like 
your average American, I say this all the time, like we are taught since childhood that Israelis good, Palestinians bad. Like that's it. And that's 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 as far as it goes for a lot of people. And uh the well to Corey, what you were talking about is uh like the the Democrats are trying to play it safe. I that's an interesting um uh, way to look at it. I hadn't thought of it that way because the way I've I haven't seen the numbers on this on like how many Jewish Americans are like pro Zionist and because I don't feel like it'd be a majority, but you are right that there, it would be some percentage of them and they don't want to lose those votes either. So like whatever, whatever the percentage would be, they wouldn't want to lose it. So it's, it's just looking worse and worse. And a lot of people are saying that, you know, Biden not taking a strong stance, uh, you know, in solidarity with the people who are obviously uh, being persecuted here is going to hurt him in the next election. And it might, it might, I am not quite as convinced that it's going to be as big of a, the, uh, here's what it will be. If this conflict goes on in a public fashion in this, at this level for the next year, yeah. and it probably won't. Sure. And cause we people for uh, people forget stuff like, just like that, they'll be on to the next cycle, yeah. and there will be a, there will be a portion of like maybe the Arab population, the Palestinian Americans, like yeah, that's going to. But like as on a major scale, I'm I'm not uh, convinced that it's it's going to be as big as people think it's going to be. What do you think, Corey? Well, one thing, well, I agree with that. I'm not sure how it's going to affect Biden next year, and it does depend on how strong this thing continues. But Ek pointed out something very interesting about the 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 I guess you could say the transition that has been made on. Yes, we've always been very pro-Israel as a country. However, there used to be this, this hope for a two-state solution. And as he pointed out, you go back to Reagan, you go back even further to Carter, uh, you go all the way back to Kennedy. There, there was always uh, a thing where it was like, okay, we're going to support Israel. We're going to give you money. Eventually, we're going to give you weapons. And then eventually, we're going to give you a lot of money. But we're always going to tell you, hey, don't necessarily go too far into the West Bank. Don't necessarily go too far into Gaza. Uh, leave Golem Heights alone. Leave East Jerusalem alone. It's like there was always that expectation. And, you know, you go back to the Clinton administration. There was a lot of uh, back and forth there. Uh, as he just pointed out, George W. Bush was very critical. Uh, in fact, Israel was actually critical of Bush after 9-11 because he was so critical of what they were doing because Israel was trying to use 9-11 as an excuse to push further into West Bank, claiming that Palestinians were somehow involved with in 9-11 when we know that that wasn't really true at all. And so there had been for a long time this 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 sort of we're pro-Israel, but you know, we kind of want a two-state solution. We're not really gonna do a whole lot to achieve that, but we're gonna at least on the face of it seem like we want that. And then somewhere along the line, he pointed out a good year, 2019, somewhere along the line, when Trump was in office, it was just the flip, the, the switch flipped, and it was just like. After the two-state solution, just be pro-Israel and that's it. And then, you know, when Trump moving the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, and uh, I think, I think, and one of his biggest questions was, was EK was saying like, well, how, how did that happen? I think a lot of it has to do with Christian national, uh, Christian extremism. I, I, I believe that under Trump, we've seen an increase in, in Christian extremism and there's all these weird, and, and I, and I was raised Christian by the way, but there's all these weird philosophies regarding the existence of Israel and tying that to the second coming of Christ. And like, I, I used to hear that when I was a kid sometimes. And it was weird to me because hist historically speaking, America was always very anti-Semitic until Israel came into existence. Like before World War yep. II, it was yep. always extremely anti-Semitic. Then Israel comes into existence and then it's kind of like, eh, you know, there wasn't really a strong public support for or against it. But then somewhere online in the 70s and 80s, and I think this had a lot to do with the, you know, the revivals and the evangelical rise in, in the country, we started to become like, oh no, we have to protect Israel because that somehow benefits us when it comes to like Christ returning or something. And I think that that, that notion has, has just gotten more and more popular in Christian circles as of late, and that has a lot to do with uh, Republican support uh, of Israel. It's really strange, but it's just gotten more and more staunch over the years. And I think that that is one of the primary reasons why we've gone from seeking a two-state solution to, you know, looking like we're seeking a two-state solution, they're not really doing about it, to now, if it just pro-Israel, you know, get rid of everybody else. And so I think the Christian extremism has a lot to do with that. Yeah, yeah. Like, Another thing with the, uh, oh, for as far as like Christian extremism, take Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, Miss Jewish Space Lasers, anti Semitic AF. Like, no censure on that, though. That's cool. She supports Israel. Co like, supporting Israel because you think, you know, that 
Israel or that Jerusalem coming back or what is it that uh that all the Jews will go back to Israel and that will trigger the second coming of Christ. It's like the most anti-Semitic thing I've ever heard in my life. You're supporting their side so that you can bring about the end of days for everybody because you might get raptured. That is the most anti-Semitic shit ever. That like I'm I'm sorry, but like that's okay. Like that, that's the thing. Like I would argue that we're still pretty anti-Semitic, you know, as a country, at least conservatives, very anti-Semitic, especially when you have like the, the Christian Zionists and everything. That is very anti-Semitic. But like that's like an okay form of anti-Semitism. It's like yeah. it's it's cool to throw in because like, oh well, I'm throwing in with your with your country that I want you to go back to because I don't want you in my country. That is some anti-Semitic shit, man. I'm sorry. You you can't roll that like any other way. The, I think that you have a little bit of a, uh, you know, how like we're like, oh, God, we got to choose between Biden and Trump like that sucks. I think with like the white supremacists, you got a little bit. Oh, yeah, we got to choose between the Jews and the Muslims. What the <laughs> fuck this? I guess we'll choose the Jews uh, for now. I do think car, dude is like, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I mean, that's I think, a good, that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> I, I think that even beyond just like the evangelical stuff, I think nine 11 probably had a lot to do oh, yeah. with yeah. just the shift. You know, we, we talk about, you know, Reagan and stuff, but like, we didn't hate Muslims quite as much back then. Like they, oh, no, they existed. No. You know, we didn't we didn't like how Muhammad Ali changed his name, but like 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 it, it was kind of just like an afterthought. It was like secondary yeah. racism. It wasn't the most important thing. But yeah. like ever since 9-11, it's like, oh, we got an enemy. And Palestine has been that. Like, like, like it's just default in a lot of Americans' brains. Oh, the Muslims are the bad guys. They're the terrorists. Um, and it's just like I saw like a Ben Shapiro tweet today. Ben Shapiro is the fucking most vile Zionist out there. Like he's awful. But it was, he was like it was a video of like people on a college campus. They had some sort of Arabic headdress on. I, I don't know what it was called. Um, and he he was like, oh, they're dressed as terrorists. And it was like it's just a fucking yeah. Arabic headdress. Like what are you talking? Like how Ridiculous. racist can you possibly be? Like I thought we sort of moved past this a little bit. Um, but I do think the one thing that has been said during this during this conversation that I disagreed with was when Corey said that Democrats are in a little bit between a rock and a hard place right now. And I kind of disagree with that because 80 percent of the Democratic Party is calling for a ceasefire. And that was a number I read a week ago. It's probably more than that now. Like, I don't when it comes to specifically supporting Rashida Tlaib and saying, you know, from the river to the sea, I can see that. But the Democrat, the DNC, the politicians in Congress are wildly disconnected from the party right now. We have Joe Biden just said today that there will be no call for ceasefire, that absolutely none. And it's like, how can the people in Congress be so disconnected from the will of the people here? Like, it's it's not even a close call. It's insane to me. I've never seen something with that near unanimous support be completely rejected by the head of a party. Um, and I do think that this is going to play out in a massive progressive wave come next November, um, because I think all of these Democrats are putting themselves in danger of being primaried. Well, yeah, they are putting themselves in danger of being primary. That's absolutely correct. And I and I sort of agree with you in the fact that you're absolutely right on the left. Yeah, mm -hmm. widespread support for a ceasefire and widespread mm -hmm. support for Palestine, 100%. But what, what I'm saying is, if you look at Jewish members of Congress, like literally mm -hmm. every Jewish senator is a Democrat. Every mm -hmm. Jewish congressperson is a Democrat except for one. And what I'm saying is I believe that they're trying to, um, you know, not necessarily just cater to them, but also the Jewish vote in places like Nevada and Florida is pretty critical, if, if only for some House seats, but also mm -hmm. Nevada is going to be a major battleground state. And I just think it's in the back of their mind. The back of their mind is like, you know, we, we don't want to, to push uh, valuable votes away. Uh, but I do 100 percent agree that the majority of liberals and progressives want a, a ceasefire and they are very critical of Israel and very pro-Palestinian. However, like you said, it's, it's that's the difference between like liberals and Democrats. Like the Democratic Party does not listen to its base. It does mm -hmm. not pay attention to what its base wants, what its base needs. And that has been my biggest criticism of Democrats in the last four or five years is that they're, they've got a whole different agenda at the top of it versus what people actually want and what the voters, their constituents actually want. 
So I 100% agree that the, the voters want something very different from what the people want. But what I would say is like, if you're an Arab American or Muslim American, and this just sickens you, and you're thinking, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to vote for these Democrats who kind of want aid for Gaza, but they're still giving money to Israel? Or am I going to vote for Republicans who absolutely basically are pro-genocide? I think you're either going to just either sit that election out, which I feel like most of them are going to do, or they're still going to eventually vote Democrat because at the very least, you get some nuance there. Whereas with Republicans, you basically just get fascism and just pro-genocide, you know, nonsense. So I, I do think, as, as TJ said earlier, it depends on how this plays out over the next year. But if it, it continues at this level for over a year, and we're talking like hundreds of thousands dead, you know, or even more, then no, the Democrats are going to have a serious problem. And, and that's going to play very poorly for them in November of next year.